This Week in Parasitism is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twip. This Week in Parasitism, episode number 51, recorded on February 27th, 2013. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and with me is Dixon Despommier. Hello, Vincent. How are you, Dixon? I'm very well, thank you. Good to see you, and... and uh, it's good to be doing another one within a week of the last one, isn't it? <laughs> Finally, it's this week in parasitism uh, realized. <laughs> yes. Today we are going to have a guest, aren't we? We are. And um, we haven't actually phoned him up yet. That's going to be interesting then, isn't it? So we thought we would do it as part of the show. What do you think about that? That would be great. So we had picked a paper. Yes. And it turned out that you knew the author the PI. It's true. So you emailed him and he agreed to do it like on a day's notice, right? And not only that, he's on a, he's on sabbatical right now too. Where is he on sabbatical? I think he's hanging out at his home. <laughs> <laughs> nice. He's hiding from the administrators. <laughs> wow. But he does go to work every now and then because that's how I found out he was on uh, sabbatical leave because his secretary told me. And he knows that 2 p.m. Eastern is 11 a.m. Western. No, I right? hope he knows that. Yeah, he's a pretty smart guy, actually. Because <laughs> he's not online yet. He's not online. Should, well, of course, he might not have accepted my invitation. Should we say who he is yet? N- oh, we're going to introduce him. No, 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 we don't okay. tell him. We'll we we will surprise our listeners. Maybe he won't show up and you and I will have to discuss the paper, <laughs> right? Which we were going to do anyway. Yeah, we, I was fully prepared <clears throat> last night. I was reading his papers. Yep. And um, then I got an email from you. Saying that the guy had agreed to do it. Yep. What coincidence. Why wouldn't they? It just so happens that the paper we're going to do was also referred to in an article in the New York Times magazine. That is correct. On Sunday, February 24th. Indeed. And um, we we might get to that as well. Yes. In fact, we are going to get uh, our guest's take on that article, because I'm sure he's painfully aware of what was said. Presumably he's read it, right? I presume so, too. And um, then yes, um, we'll do some e- We'll let him go, and if there's time left, we can do email. If We might use all the time up, and then that will be the end of it. That will be fine. But I do have a lot of email that came in response to our pleas last week, <laughs> <laughs> which is very nice. A lot of silent listeners out there. A lot there. of people responded, which is really good. Well, that's good. We were just kidding, everybody. <laughs> and you were very sad. I, well, that, I, I don't think I felt sad. I mean, I was just joking. All right. Now I'm going to type his name in Skype here and see if I can roust him up. Yep. Um, uh, Anthony A. James. Oh, I gave his name Whoops. away. Should I call him up? Sure. And um, he'll be mad at you, right? Nah, he won't be mad at me. It's not his style. Hello? All right. <laughs> Hello there. <laughs> hey, Tony. Somehow I recognize that voice. Hey, <laughs> How you I'm doing? Tony James, Vincent, um, Dixon needs no introduction. He doesn't. No, I, I hear you guys are old friends. Um. Uh, how about just friends? Uh, we're still young, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, Tony, you wouldn't recognize me if you saw me today. How's that? <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm feeling probably the same, actually. <laughs> you, you look a lot younger than Dixon, though. I've seen a few pictures of you online, unless they're very old. They you, might, well, <laughs> he is younger than I am. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> there you go. Absolutely. By a lot. He looks 40 years younger than you. Yeah, this is. Uh, <laughs> come on now, don't be cool. <laughs> Are you my contemporary? I was born in 1953. Um, 1951. Oh, you're Close. So I'm the young boy here. You are. All right. By the way, uh, you are. Uh, how's the sound quality? Sound quality is good. We'll be we'll be really good. I appreciate you're doing this. Oh, okay, I, I do too. By the way, you are um, in the same department as my friend Bert Semler. Oh, absolutely. Bert absolutely. and I, Bert and I go way back. Yeah, I was. Um, he, he's a actually a really good friend. I mean, how far is way back for you? <laughs> 
Uh, so we we knew each other when we were both postdocs, basically. So this was in uh, Stony so, Brook or San Diego. So he was a postdoc in Stony Brook. And yeah, I was a postdoc at MIT in the in the lab of a competitor of his PI. Oh, okay. so, but we were friends nonetheless. Yeah, it must have been fun. <laughs> yeah, and we we kept in touch, and I, I see Bert a lot, and I know yeah. he just turned the big six zero as I did. Yeah, yeah, it's scary, huh? Yes, it sure is. Well, we should tell our guests. We're recording now. We should tell our okay. guests who we're speaking with. Exactly, we're speaking with a professor in the Department of Molecular Biology and Biochemistry at the University of California, Irvine, Anthony A. James. Is that the right department for you? Uh, well, actually, I've got one of these split appointments, so I'm also in microbiology and molecular genetics. Cool. So, um, and that's I Bert's guess, department, right? That is correct, yes. Where are, you, are you near Bert or not, not so close um, to Actually, my, um, so the split appointment has me in the medical school and then the School of Biological Sciences. Mm-hmm. And uh, the School of Biological Sciences uh, basically put together the infrastructure for um, our ability to grow the insects that we work with. And uh, uh, actually, was my first department of hire, and so um, I'm physically located there. But it's it's walk- walking distance. Can you give us a thumbnail of your uh, your background and training? Yes, I uh, was essentially trained in genetics, um, uh, essentially pre molecular genetics, uh, working with uh, Drosophila melanogaster, the fruit fly. And I was interested in uh, topics associated with pattern formation, how, um, how simple systems organize to, during development to produce patterns, uh, genetically determined patterns. Um, as a postdoc, I went to uh, Boston, uh, worked at the laboratory of uh, Richard Kladner and worked on uh, recombination. Mm-hmm. Um, we had a very simple model at the time that... Um, Recombination was going to be like replication, you know, an enzymatic pathway with very defined components to it. And uh, surprisingly, and, and in a really nice way, it turned out to be quite different. And uh, um, it, that, uh, it gave a different perspective on what was happening with uh, DNA. I returned then to a second postdoc um, at uh, Brandeis University working on circadian rhythms in uh, Drosophila. But then had an opportunity to join uh, the faculty at the Harvard School of Public Health uh, to apply the sort of molecular genetic tools that were being developed for the fruit fly to mosquitoes. And so I applied for and got a job there as, as an assistant professor in the Department of Tropical Public Health. And that's where I first met uh, Dixon. Tony, were you there when Robert Gwads was there? Um, I wasn't, actually. He left after I did. Um, uh, I overlapped Jose Ribeiro for about uh, oh, sure. a year and a half or so, yeah. um, uh, Phil Rossignol, and then um, uh, they went on and I, I stayed, yeah. Right. So mm-hmm. how, you got to know Dixon because working on mosquitoes, you encounter other parasitologists, right? Um, so, yes, our principal... Um, uh, uh, audience initially early on uh, were the parasitology uh, groups and um, we have a national organization actually international organization though it's called the American Society for Tropical Medicine and Hygiene right. and um, uh, I joined early on in my career and uh, um, he wasn't quite then one of the silverbacks but Dixon was there and influential <laughs> I had the opportunity to, to meet him there and interact with him uh, uh, from then on. And then I think we were at a number of Gordon conferences together and yeah, were specialized meetings. Sure. Don't you recall that uh, the Gordon conferences used to exclude vector biology? They and, did. And when I was uh, the co-chair with Elmer Pfefferkorn, we both thought this was an egregious act on the part of the rest of the membership. So we purposely uh, asked you to join us. I to- think, well, yeah, that, that actually that clicks in because there was a year when, very early on in my career, when I was asked to organize a session um, and I think that's when you guys asked me to do it. That's and right. We've been friends ever since. You bet. Even <laughs> we've even been fishing together. Yeah. <laughs> so when you began to do the the mosquito work, did you have any particular parasite in mind, or were you were purely interested in mosquito biology? Well, actually, I was interested in in, a, in an aspect of mosquito biology and genetics that I mm-hmm. thought we could exploit. Um, from very early on, I I had an applied p- focus. I, I was. Uh, very much interested in answering a question of whether or not genetics could contribute to um, the uh, control 
of vector-borne diseases. I mean, what was in genetics? I was aware, for example, that uh, immunology can contribute through vaccines and chemistry and aspects of chemistry can contribute through the development of insecticides or therapeutic drugs. But the question was, you know, you have this major discipline, genetics, can it, can it actually add something to this, this uh, uh, you know, palette of, of uh, scientific approaches that were being uh, applied to vector-borne disease? And so I, I came at it from a genetics perspective. And um, at the time, the specific insect species and the specific pathogens that I was interested in, uh, sorry, that I developed an interest in, uh, were driven by the constraints on the experimental systems that were available in the laboratory. Right. And this is, it's not just the parasitology side, but also the vector biology side. Mm. And it's in, it, 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 I, I don't want to diminish the work of people who went before me, but, um, you know, th there was absolutely, or very, very, very little done with uh, modern genetics and molecular biology when vectors when I started working on this. Yep. And so um, the development of the research program focused our attention on a number of uh, vectors and a number of target pathogens. And so we ultimately ended up working to target dengue viruses and, and their respective vectors and uh, malaria parasites and their respective vectors. And, and he's done remarkable work ever since because not only are you well trained, Tony, but you are also a great trainer. So, uh, you know, I've heard rumors that your graduate students are doing very well out there as well. So uh, this is uh, great to hear from you again at this stage of your career. Anthony, weren't you at the American Society for Virology meeting last summer in, uh, in Madison? I was, as a matter of fact. Yeah, you were uh, the keynote speaker, right? Uh, that is true. Uh, uh, small, small world. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I, <laughs> it came about, I mean, it, it was legitimate. I mean, I, I, I love doing thank you viruses, and uh, I learned how to pronounce Flavy virus. There you go. <laughs> yeah. um, no, see, now, it, all of a sudden, as you were speaking, I remember uh, hearing huh. you, and I put the name together, and then I knew Bert Semler was president of ASV. And he had been telling me he thought it would be yeah. cool to get a guy like you who does a lot of applied stuff and also works in very different areas. Yeah, I think the president, Bert, at the time was, was interested in uh, bringing in something. He explained it to me so he could get me to go. Um, that he wanted somebody to come in and, I mean, it, was, it is, you know, it's, it's not hardcore virology, but it certainly deals with virus, you know, major pathogenic viruses. And so I think he was really interested in, um, in uh, you know, having the, the society hear about, you know, people working sort of at the fringes of their, of their sort of principal interest, but, you know, also, um, what he thought, doing something worth yeah. hearing. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. sure. So it's, it's very interesting. On Monday, uh, Dixon and I were looking for some papers to do on our on our podcast here. So and I I went into PLOS uh, neglected tropical diseases and yours your recent one was right there on the front page. And that's the one about field cage studies of uh, genetically engineered mosquitoes. Yes. So I said to Dixon, let's do this paper. He said, "Good idea." And he said, "Is is, is Tony James on that?" I said, "Yeah, he's your <laughs> <laughs> And then he ended up calling you and uh, so this is all amazing. Things don't always work this well. Yeah, but that weekend, uh, you'll recall also, Vince, that I, uh, my wife and I do the Times crossword puzzle on Sunday morning. Yeah. And, of course, in that magazine section, there was a whole article about genetically engineered mosquitoes and the, yeah. uh, the pitfalls yeah. and some of the uh, dangers of, of and, overinterpretation. And, and, Tony, you were quoted in that article, I believe. <laughs> right? As a matter of fact, yeah. Uh, that's right. <laughs> so I was wondering, maybe we could get into this story a little bit. In this paper, you use... Um, flightless mosquitoes, right? I wonder if you could tell us the background. No, no, no. Before we do that, can I just ask Tony to recall the moment in his life when he learned <laughs> how to transfect mosquitoes and the, and the result that he got? Because I recall hearing that from him <laughs> as a personal account of an aha moment that was really remarkable. Uh, I'm still in therapy over this. <laughs> Come um, on, so, tell us the story. Uh, tell us the story. Right. So I was working with a group of people. Um, we we were part of a, 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 a network that was funded by the uh, MacArthur Foundation. It was called the Network on the 
uh, biology of disease vectors, and it, it was a follow-up to a, a, a network or consortium that they had previously set up called the Consortium on the Biology of Parasitism, and that's actually that that initial consortium was what what uh, made my position available in the Department of Tropical Public Health at Harvard, and then later on uh, they they spun off a program that dealt specifically with the vectors. So that background is that uh, we had a, a small group of people who were interested in pushing ahead um, uh, the application of molecular tools, molecular and genetic tools to vector biology, and um, we, you know, asked a number of questions. And actually, these questions had been asked before, but you know, we we revisited them and asked, you know, said, "What's the most important thing we could do uh, technically to advance this field?" And um, transgenesis. That is the ability to stably introduce DNA um, into um, a target organism came up right on top of the list, and this was very early on. And um, uh, and D once again, it, the actual thinking behind it started before the network. It's just the network actually provided us the resources to get involved in this. What year is this roughly? Uh, well, so uh, I was I, I was in the consortium in '86. Wow, uh, maybe even earlier, but okay. uh, and, but. Uh, in, in 90, 1990, we, we, the network is set up, and then we, we actually had the funding to do uh, a, a more aggressive approach to doing this. So this was quite a while back. Now, having said that, it was only a few years after transformation of Drosophila. So it, 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 it lagged, but it didn't lag significantly behind it. So that, that is the actual work on it. Now, having said that... <clears throat> it took us 10 years to achieve. Okay. And we tried everything. Um, we tried what worked in Drosophila, and um, basically, when it initially didn't work, our attitude is, okay, we're going to fix it. And um, uh, <laughs> it, we, we tried illegitimate recombination. We tried everything. I mean, I'd, I'd worked with Richard Claudner on you know, the basis of recombination in E. coli, so I knew that there were a lot of things that could happen that would generate recombinants. And indeed, a laboratory had managed to put a gene into a mosquito prior to ours, but it was one of those serendipitous events that, that could not be repeated and did not lead to a stable system. Was that Lou Miller by any chance? <laughs> exactly. That was a Lou Miller group. Well, he was my classmate here at Columbia a long time ago. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was a very special thing. It was actually a, a, a non-homologous integration into the telomere, um, and, uh, but that, that did not make a system. You know, that was, that was in a uh, uh, an anomaly, and it didn't result in a, something that's repeatable. So the folks in Drosophila have been working on transposable elements, and so we had uh, quite a bit of success with those, and so we were um, uh, looking at those elements, but the ones that were working in Drosophila did not work in, in mosquitoes, and so uh, I told you it took 10 years to do this. In, in defense of that long effort, um, the things that actually ended up working had not been discovered when we started out. Mm. So, like there, <laughs> required new new discoveries to actually make this work. But the key thing, um, in addition to having a, 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 you know an element that would work, it, actually there were three key things to this. The, the first one was to have some kind of experimental system that would tell us whether or not a uh, transposable element even had a chance to get in. And so some colleagues of mine, uh, uh, David O'Brock and Al Handler and Peter Atkinson had worked out what were called plasma mobility assays. And, and what that allowed us to do was to look at specific transposable elements and ask in the environment of the mosquito embryo, which is where we place these things, can they even move around? And so we, we asked, you know, can, can they move to another plasma? And so you can use some really nice microbiology to show that. And so that allowed us to sort through elements that had a potential for use and uh, also prove that the ones that were in Drosophila were not going to work for us. And so uh, this notion that we could fix them was, was uh, naive at best. So once we had some candidate molecule or candidate uh, transposable elements that we knew could mobilize, that is, there was nothing in the mosquito that was preventing them from moving, we started to ask the question, okay, can we get them into chromosomes now? Not just move them from plasma to plasma, but into chromosomes. And for that, we needed markers. And... Um, our markers were horrible at the time. Uh, we were working with insecticide resistance and um, screening for insecticide resistance as a positive selection for a recombinant event, transgenic event, 
was just was very difficult. Um, you had to set discriminating doses, and um, uh, if you set them too high, everything dies. If you set them too low, you have a monster challenge with a lot of false positives. And I could believe that we had transgenics at that time with these insecticide resistance genes, but it, the, the cumber, features of the biology and selection made it very difficult to prove um, at the time. In retrospect, you know, things made sense, but at the time, we just couldn't put together the story. I was in um, Florence, Italy. I have a fond affection for Italy. A buddy of mine, Frank Collins, and I uh, were at a meeting called the, the International Congress of Entomology, and we decided to take an afternoon off and grab hills there and found a spot where we could kind of hang out in the sun, drink a little wine, eat, eat food, and talk about stuff. And he told me that a person in his lab had done an experiment where they'd taken a gene from Drosophila that, uh, that controlled uh, the development of eye color and put it into a wide-eyed mosquito mutant for that, that particular uh, enzyme. And this was a transient assay. Once again, we didn't have transgenesis. They just sort of injected this thing in there. And they transiently got color in the eyes. And um, when I heard that, I knew this was going to work. <laughs> and and my, um, my deal with Frank is that, you know, he could be the communicating author on the paper and we would do all the work. <laughs> <laughs> And so, uh, and this, that we were able to show that uh, this Hermes transposon was able to integrate into um, the genome of the, uh, it was at the time called the yellow fever mosquito, though nowadays it's called the dengue vector. Um, <laughs> the flavivirus virus vector. <laughs> so this was a transposable element from Drosophila that worked in, in mosquitoes, is that correct? So this came from a housefly. Housefly. <laughs> wow. Discovered by uh, Peter Atkinson, and he called it Hermes. Oh, see, and, and, uh, and, and you use that to this day to to mobilize DNA into mosquitoes. One of the complicating factors with Hermes is that the way it integrates is not in a canonical way that a transposable element would mobilize. It mm -hmm. it doesn't do it. It doesn't do it the simple cut and paste way that the you know the textbook show. It, it's a little bit complicated. It's it's kind of messy, and that was another reason when we were working with insecticide genes that we had a lot of trouble figuring out what was going on. So we had this, this you know, it's one of these crazy things where, um, you know, we'd worked 10 years to, to try to get something to work. We got it to work. Within a month, we had a second one working. So sure. this is an element called, um, which actually doesn't really work very well at all in Drosophila, like a charm in mosquitoes. What was the uh, name of that again? We missed that. Mariner, M -A -R. Mariner. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, sure. uh, it, um, at least it works well in Aedes aegypti, the specific mosquito. And you used fluorescent green protein as a, tr as a marker, yes? All of our early work was, it was in this white, white eye mutant strain and we were bringing in colored eye markers. But as soon as the, the fluorescent proteins became available, of right. course, we were right on those because it, uh, a dominant marker, dominant viable marker was good and we could work with wild type strains of mosquitoes and not you know not work in this Tony time. Tony could you uh, email us a picture of that mosquito we'll put it up on the uh, website for this one because <laughs> the mosquito from hell when you fluoresce those green eyes and you showed us those pictures it looked really menacing I mean if, if you're not afraid of mosquitoes before that you will be after you see this picture <laughs> colors you know being of a certain generation you know but it's <laughs> Email me though, because uh, um, I'm in the middle of a whole bunch of stuff, and, and uh, sure. it's okay to follow up on things. <laughs> <laughs> we heard you're on sabbatical, but that can't be right because you're right next to the university. <laughs> it's always good to follow up. Yeah, you didn't so, you didn't go off to Italy for your sabbatical, unfortunately. Huh? Uh, I'm going again. I'm going uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm spending the time now uh, writing manuscripts, which you need to get out. Uh, and then, um, uh, and also grants, which, you know, that's, that's the way life is right, right now. Right. Were you associated with the Chico group over there? No, I'm not. No. So, Dixon, can we get back to um, flight? I'm just curious how you got to that, pursuing flightless. That was the main technical uh, thing that we needed. We needed transgenesis. Okay. Right. However, um, that was only the middle portion of a plan that we'd... we'd uh, uh, as our, our, our laboratory research group had adopted. 
And um, there were three parts of that plan. The, the first part of the plan was to, um, to uh, uh, isolate and characterize from mosquito uh, genes whose control sequences allow them to express things in interesting ways in the mosquitoes. And so, uh, and compartments in the mosquito were the midgut, the open circulatory system, the salivary glands, because that's where the pathogens were. So we knew if we were going to make genes that had an impact on the pathogens, we have to be able to put something, uh, you know, where the pathogens were. So uh, there's a lot of early work from my lab looking at the characterization of uh, genes that are expressed in salivary glands, and and uh, we chose salivary glands at the time because we knew if we well, let's put it a different way. I figured that if we were working on midguts and we were trying to publish papers, you know, cloning an, an, uh, a mosquito trypsin gene or other protease type gene would be, you know, nice, but not great. <laughs> Being developed by Jose Ribeiro, the biochemistry and pharmacology was extremely interesting. And we thought, okay, anything we clone out of and characterize in the salivary glands is going to be brand new, it's going to be exciting. So we focused initially on the salivary glands. So that's thing one, getting promoters that could do things. Things two were the transgenesis. And then thing three was what the effector was going to be. What, what is the molecule actually um, uh, going to do to the pathogen? All right, so we have to pause there and take a step back and say, you know, what was the purpose of genetically engineering these mosquitoes? And there were two main strategies. One was a population suppression strategy, so it's to develop essentially genetic analogs to the use of insecticides or other types of things that would reduce insect populations. And then the other thing was what was called population replacement, but now is being more accurately described as population modification. And there, the target actually isn't the mosquito, it's the pathogen in the mosquito. So the idea is to make a mosquito that is resistant to a specific pathogen and, um, through the introduction of, of novel genetic material. So um, that's a really interesting story, but you asked about the flightless one, and, and um, uh, that, that's a population suppression strategy. Mm. The idea there is based on the fact that um, uh, two things. It's, it's the, from what we can tell of mosquito ecology, Competition, the intraspecific and interspecific competition for resources is generally at the subadult stages, the larval stages. And so um, there was some talk about, well, you know, if you if you remove insects from from competing with one another, then the few they get through will actually be much bigger and fitter and more robust. And so, uh, uh, as a design feature, it was thought, well, if we had late-acting lethal genes then, you know, we could have these mosquitoes beating up each, on each other as they develop. <laughs> as they become, they, they enter the, um, the, the insignificant in the transmission cycle. And for people who aren't aware, it's only the females that feed on blood, and it's the, only the females that are actually significant in, in transmission dynamics. So, um, I was working with a colleague, Luke Alfie, and he developed uh, this concept, concept behind developing conditional dominant lethals. So these are genes that when present in a single copy uh, create some kind of lethality, but of course they have to be conditional because otherwise you couldn't work on it. And so he was working that out and I told him it, uh, I can't remember what the circumstances were, but I told him that I, you know, I was really interested in that. And we looked for promoters that uh, would allow late expression of, uh, of a trans gene. And so uh, I had a postdoc, uh, actually a visiting professor come as a postdoc for a couple of years, as a, a visiting researcher, and uh, this is uh, Delia Munoz, who uh, used old-fashioned technologies to look for female-specific and then female-specific in adult uh, gene expression, and came up with a gene that, that has been called uh, actin-4. And uh, it turns out the actin, this is a female-specific actin, which is expressed in the flight muscles, and when coupled to this population suppression technology, um, uh, basically disables the flight muscles. So you end up with mosquitoes, female mosquitoes that can't fly. And so the males are fine. And in principle, you can use the males to uh, release them into the field. They'll mate with wild females, and then their daughters won't be able to fly. 
and then with uh, progression, um, uh, uh, you know, you have suppression of the population. Mm. So um, uh, there are a series of papers that came out. One, uh, the initial one early on was uh, uh, one from the Alpha lab that, that sort of explored the principles of dominant lethals in Drosophila. And then following up on that um, was a paper from our lab describing this gene, the ACID4 gene. And then as part of a collaboration, um, uh, we built 80s aegypti that were, uh, so there's a dengue fever mosquito, uh, that, were, uh, that had this particular gene in them. And we showed at a basic level in the laboratory that worked. We took it to larger, large cages in the laboratory and it worked like a charm. Uh, what, are, what is working like a charm mean? <laughs> right. <laughs> we looked at the help of modelers to predict, to help us do design and expectation uh, for how the strain would perform. And so they could tell us, you know, what release ratios we would need and then predict what the period of uh, release would have to be in order to see an effect. And so um, in, in laboratory circumstances, it, it met and exceeded uh, modeling uh, parameters. Uh, we then wanted to take the next step up um, and try it in large cage trials uh, in a disease endemic area. Uh, the idea being that we could be in cages that were more like, um, uh, you know, wild conditions, but still, you know, behind a screen so, so that uh, uh, we, we had some containment. And it, it, it's fair to say that and it is true that concomitant with the scientific development, we, we had to do what's called community engagement, um, which was to try to determine what kinds of uh, social, cultural, ethical, legal expectations uh, would have to be met in order to be able to conduct experiments with genetically modified mosquitoes. And we put a lot of effort into that. and probably have time to talk about it today, but we might get back to it later. Uh, but um, uh, this was a, a brand new area, and so uh, in addition to just doing the work in the cages and doing the experiments, we also made significant progress on defining uh, the kinds of things that would be necessary to do to demonstrate um, efficacy and uh, in an ethical way uh, for the use of the clean tools. So one of the big things that we were challenging, of course, was a scale-up of release. And so you're doing something in a lab, you've got a small container, you go to larger cages, and then going to Mexico, and with what the paper you, you have in hand about is our experience then in these large cages. So these are cages, but they're still outside. They're outside in, in so a cage, right? Outside. Uh, sorry, they're, the, the screens are open to the outside. They're, they're double-layered inside to, to provide containment, but they're <clears throat> subject to local temperature, humidity, et cetera, mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. And uh, what we found um, was two things. And I have to be very careful explaining it this way because this is what happened. And this gets, we get back to our modeling and our modelers, and you know they, they have given us predictions for how things would work. And, uh, when we went into these larger cage formats, the, the, uh, the data were such that the uh, dynamics of, of gene uh, flow and population suppression were such that it was not meeting the model parameters. It was taking much longer than we had actually modeled. So we're, uh, you know, the vernacular on the street is that, they didn't, okay, well, they were working, and they were working much slower, and um, there were issues there that were only evident uh, by doing that scale up. Uh, and there seemed to be issues with male competition that were not evident in these smaller cage formats. Even Very interesting, yeah. So you're looking for the replacement. So you have a cage full of mosquitoes, and then you put in your males carrying the flightless gene. Were, so you look for the gene flowing into that, and of course right. their dogs can't fly, so eventually the population is expected to crash. And do you measure this because the the males have a a red marker, for example, and you can measure that in the in the population, or is there some other way? The gene had a um, the trans gene that was put in was marked with a red fluorescent protein. Okay, and uh, so we were able to monitor the 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 number of transgenic animals that were in the cages following the release. Okay, and these experiments were non-trivial. Um, sure, <laughs> uh, 
imagine, I mean, you know, we have a cage. Um, imagine, you know, setting up a stable population of organisms in a caged environment. It, you know, you can't even do that with E. coli. Yeah. Right? yeah. Right. I understand you also mated these with local mosquitoes. Out right? of a, a protocol that, that gives you sort of population stability so that you can actually do this kind of work. Right. It, you can do it with E. coli. It's the same way we did it, which is that you've got to constantly remove or replenish the population dependent upon a specific set of, uh, of uh, uh, monitoring criteria. And, um, you know, under those circumstances, you can say, okay, we have a stable population. So was it surprising to you that simply moving the cages outdoors had this effect? Well, because we had so much success, yeah. <laughs> but then the moment people heard that this was happening, they all said, you know, well, we could have told you that. <laughs> yeah, of sure. course, of course. <laughs> In of hindsight, course. yeah. That's right. So what's next for this uh, flight list? Is there anything left to do? or um, We have to do a couple. Well, so, you know, we had funding to do essentially one trial with one strain. And that that funding's ending, and, um, you know, we're not able to go back and test that now, which is kind of sad. I, would, I mean, it was just a single trial. I mean, we, we did a lot of follow-up, but the, the big experiment was a single one. So on a certain level, it's not too surprising. I mean, you know, uh, I don't know how many people who do experiments that work the first time. but you know. <laughs> It never works again if you do. <laughs> so I'm just curious, how do you make the, the mosquito flight list? Do you express something that's toxic to the muscle? We had this flight-specific actin, and so we got the control sequences of this actin gene. Uh -huh. Use that to drive something that have been ultimately down the road. It's just too te you have to have the conditional lethality in there, so you need another step. But what that does is then it drives something that's toxic to the flight muscles, and these females emerge but they have uh, damaged flight muscles and can't fly. Okay, okay. Right. Hmm. Now, is uh, the other approach that you mentioned, which is to make... Modify. modify so they're resistant to a particular virus. Is that more promising? Does that involve Volbachia? Because I know that's been talked about a lot. Um, in our case, no. Okay. Um, and, and this actually, um, I mean, this is really, I mean, I'm interested in all of this, but this is the one where I'm put putting a lot of efforts right now. Um, um, so to take a step back, the, the sort of biology that this approach is based on um, is knowing that there are a lot of things out there that feed on blood. We talk about, you know, lots of hematophagous arthropods because we want to throw the ticks in there. But there are a lot of blood-feeding insects. And, you know, we got black flies, we got mosquitoes, we got sand flies, we've got fleas. I mean, there are a lot of things out there. And there are a lot of blood-borne pathogens. So, you know, we've got uh, malaria parasites, Leishmania parasites, all different kinds of viruses. Trypanosomes. Which is a bloodborne pathogen. Okay, but uh, we see that there's really high degree of host specificity for the pathogens and the vectors, such that none of them transmit HIV, for example. All right, um, only anophelines transmit human malarias, and um, only these species of that are in this group uh, that eighties are in transmit viruses. So there's a strong genetic component to that. Right? I mean, that, that's defined by the genetics. <clears throat> but even more interesting, and these are, is taking this to an experimental level, where people who were working with species of mosquitoes that were able to transmit pathogens were able to do some really interesting experiments where they would take these and they would give them an infectious blood meal of some type. And then they would look at the uh, females that came out of that, and they would segregate the females that became infected from those that weren't. And they would just repeat this process. And ultimately, they were able to select for populations within a single species that were highly resistant and then highly refractory. So this is a species in principle that has the capability of being a vector, but you can segregate out populations through selection uh, that are resistant and uh, susceptible. Now, when you have these two populations, you can do some really simple genetic experiments. You can cross them to one another. You can ask, okay, what's the relationship of these strains? Are the, are the genes dominant, recessive? How many genes are involved? And one of the 
cool things that came out of some of this early work. And it goes back to the 30s, um, <coughs> uh, uh, when some of this work was originally started. So one of the really interesting observations was um, that in many cases, a single or a small number of genes had a really profound impact on whether or not a specific species could transmit a, a specific pathogen. And so, you know, as a geneticist, I thought, oh, this is great, you know. If we could just somehow get the frequency of those genes or, or their respective alleles high enough in a population, game over. We turn a population that would normally transmit into one that cannot. Um, and when we first started this work a while back, um, uh, I, I, try, I, sat, I remember sitting down, I spent a week trying to figure out, using approaches that we knew from Drosophila, how I was going to be able to get my hands on these genes. And at the time, um, it just wasn't going to be physically possible. We, we just couldn't do the scale that would be necessary to do a genome-wide mutagenesis, screen for these you know, phenotypes that were, you know, uh, where you, you expect to get a lot of false positive. It just, it just it wasn't going to be doable. And indeed, it's still difficult, uh, but other approaches are being taken. So, um, as I often describe it, in the arrogance of the early 90s, we just decided we'd make the genes. And so... <laughs> And You're talking to somebody here, um, Vincent Racaniello, who actually did that with poliovirus from scratch. <laughs> he made a, an artificial poliovirus. <laughs> you know, let's just, yeah, exactly it. That was liberating in a, in a very interesting way because then what we could do is say, okay, if we had such a gene, what would the you can say, okay, I need a gene. It's going to be this, the, you know, these are the features. And you can say, okay, can I actually create these features? And so um, we, we started with a very simple model of the gene. So we made a very we made a very simple model of the gene, or you know, conceptualized a very simple model of the gene that had two components to it. It had a control portion, and then it had an effector portion. And the control portion would tell you when, where, and how much of something to make. And then the effector portion is the thing that actually interacts with and, and um, uh, disables the pathogen. And so um, early on thinking about it, I, I thought, well, geez, you know, malaria parasites are probably going to be easier to get at because they have, you know, extracellular forms and stuff. And uh, viruses, you know, they get into cells. And how the heck are we going to get things inside of cells? So early on, I was um, a little bit more optimistic of, uh, to be able to do this for malaria parasites than I was viruses. Um, and in our laboratory, we, we started working with a, a model system of, of uh, avian malaria parasite, Plasmodium gallinaceum, as a consequence of that. But getting back to the simple model of the gene, so, uh, you know, this cr these control domains, you know, I, I already told you about the fact that, you know, we wanted endogenous mosquito genes that whose products were expressed in strategically important places, so mid-gut open circulatory system and salivary glands. And so, you know, this, this work had been going on, uh, um, uh, you know, all the uh, while all this other stuff was going on. So, we, you know, we ended up having a number of candidate genes whose promoters could express things in, in very useful ways. And uh, in in, in not just the, the right compartments, but they had sex specificity and temporal specificity. So they were adult, female, tissue specific uh, promoters for this. And a number of them were discovered in our lab and, and other labs, and, and we've, we've taken advantage of uh, everything that's out there. Tony, in your experience, do you know of any pathogens of mosquitoes that actually give them an advantage, the mosquito the advantage, that, that allows so, them to reproduce more rather than less? Well, so people have argued that, you know, I, uh, and... Um, I mean, I don't know of any, but I thought you might have heard of some. So I'll preface that with a perspective, and then we'll go from there, uh, because the, uh, I'm not real happy with the data, so the perspective still holds. Um, uh, I always thought that the most fit insects are the ones that are going to be out there in the wild. Right. So that I just assumed that anything we did to them would make them less fit. <laughs> right. I agree. You know, bring them into the lab, you know, just, just acculturating or, you know. Uh, sure. In the lab, yeah, I just assumed that anything we did was going to make these worse off. You make pets okay. out of them. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, they get pampered and stuff. And um, Yeah, they don't uh, want to go back out. <laughs> well, you know, they, they, you know, they can't. You know, they just don't do very well. So, right, right. So, so what was important about that was that um, 
it meant that there was a whole area of sort of endeavor that I could just push away, which is having to deal with fitness on a certain level. That's not entirely true, but, um, but you know, I, I, I wasn't going to have to worry about making things that were more fit than were in the, in the field, okay, because uh, there were genetic tricks that could get around that. So in the process of doing this, um, here's, the, here's the sort of uh, um, bizarre sort of statement to make. But, you know, I used to think the worst thing in the world was molecular biologists talking about evolution. <laughs> but since then, I, I've, I've replaced that by molecular biologists talking about fitness and ecology. I, mean, uh-huh. <laughs> I just, you know, they, they, we don't really know what we're talking about. We think we know what we're talking about. We don't really know. And, um, well, I'm going to stop there before I <laughs> irritate a whole lot of people. So, so, uh, so we just said, okay, look, if you think about it, um, this flightless female, she's got pretty much out, you know, that's a, that's a serious negative load. You know what I mean? She's, she's not fit at all. Okay. But you can make it work, right? And so, so you don't need to have fitness necessarily be an impediment to the efforts you, you, you put out there if you have ways that, that make it not important. Okay, so, so, I mean, you have these lethal phenotypes. Well, lethal phenotype, that's a fitness value of zero, you know, and so, uh, but you can still use strains with fitness values that are way off. So we didn't get involved in that. Now, having said that, I do have colleagues that have done experiments, and they make claims that, well, there's big fitness impacts, and other ones say, well, no, it actually helps. And I'm convinced that one will see a, a wide spectrum of of, uh, of uh, results, depending on a lot of different things. But you know, one of them being you know what what the insertion site into the genome is. There's clearly position effects and stuff. So you know, we're trying to develop technologies that will mitigate that. We have actually developed technologies. That mitigate that. You had no idea though that that would happen in a larger cage situation compared to so the what, small cages, so right? That's exactly it. And so. Um, uh, uh, you know, there were two ways to work around that. One is to, you know, I mean, so this this was like a single gene of this type, you know, put into a single strain. You know, maybe it's in the wrong place in the genome. You know, maybe if we moved it somewhere else, it would behave more, you know, we expected. Um, uh, you know, maybe there's something with the scale of well, flight range. And it is something that, we, we you know, we, we put specifically in the, you know, so that it, that it would act in the female flight muscles. But maybe there's just enough leakage in males to compromise them as well, so they're not, you know, not anxious to wander around. Um, we can we can actually accommodate that by just releasing more of them. Sure. Okay. Sure. Uh, and th- I mean that's a possibility, but uh, um, you know, people are looking for things that that have slightly better performance uh, characteristics. How do mosquito males detect female mosquitoes? That's a good question. It's clear that they sing to one another. They do. Mm-hmm. That's right. And uh, and then people have looked for pheromones and stuff. I mean, it really looks like the male with these really bushy antenna compared to the females, which look kind of scraggly, um, should be capable of pheromone detection. But um, as far as I can tell, there haven't been really any good um, uh, you know convincing descriptions of people having isolated uh, pheromones. Uh, they're Clearly, chemical attractants right. for mosquitoes for their for their for their feeding and their host prep. Yeah, that's right. They're managing to do that with these regular, you know, raggedy old antennae that you look at, and and so um, I, I think probably the first sort of thing um, that there's sort of a random walk, but these things mate in swarms, and so they're all flying, and, and there's some really nice work out of Gabriella or Gabriel Gibson's lab in. Um, um, Laura Harrington's lab showing that at least for 80s when they meet one another they all you know they start singing the same tune and if they do that they can get together well maybe your males of the, this construct are just hard of hearing they're either hard of hearing or they're not can't play the right song you know I mean yeah, that's uh, right they can't keep up a rhythm and then, by the way everybody should know that Tony is a fantastic guitar player I hope you're still playing I am still playing good man part of the all right but, yeah <laughs> uh, it uh um, it, uh, you know, I mean, is that possible? You know, it yeah. could be, 
there are, there are issues with wing beat frequencies, and I think somebody's done some work on that and shown you know so that that might be sufficient for, to make the males less attractive. Sure, but in a, in a small cage, you you wouldn't run into that problem because of the stochastic nature of this a small cage. But in a larger cage, where you have more room and the females can spread out more, the males might find it harder to find them. Yeah, we call that the last syndrome, you know, when they're, <laughs> right. I mean, you know, well, you know, <laughs> the bell's rung, I'll just take the first guy that comes along, you know. <laughs> Tony, how far have you gotten with the the inhibitory gene concept? Do you have candidates? Have you put so any this is, in? This is actually really cool. So um, we work with a group of people at Colorado State who are outstanding virologists. And, a, and a, uh, the uh, dengue viruses are positive strand RNA viruses. And so a while back, they started looking at the impact of antisense RNAs on um, oh, yeah. dengue virus replication. And um, they, there's a really nice paper that came out in the mid-90s by Kid Olson working with Barry Beatty that showed that um, expression of antisense dengue viruses really cut down the infection really well. Huh. So... Um, um, I don't do a lot of this because they're my good friends. <laughs> <laughs> are, are, there, are there minimum numbers of viral particles that the mosquito must inject in order to initiate an infection? Well, some old work done by Sabin actually a while back, and um, it's not a lot. Um, you know that so we have we basically set zero zero pathogens in, in every system we work in. Got it. At zero is the target for the number of pathogens that, in the oh. south. Okay. Okay. That makes things easy. We don't have to absolutely real cute trying to hit a hit a threshold. We just you know yeah, yeah. get zero. It's done. Right. Uh, it, but you know the the joke was you know gee Ken if you'd figured out why it was working you could have got a piece of that prize. <laughs> <laughs> really. And it, it was an anti sense. It was you know obviously it was the RNAi that was doing this. Right. So. Ken built some really nice RNAi constructs that, when expressed in Aedes aegypti, uh, we get zero uh, viruses in the salivary. I'll right. be darned. I'll be darned. So that works. That works very well. The challenge now is that dengue viruses are four serotypes. Yes. And build, you can build sort of independent components that work against the four serotypes. Putting them all in a single gene. Has uh, has proven a challenge, and that that work is still ongoing. So, but at some point, you have to get this inhibitor into the mosquito population, right? Right. So, right. I mean, flightless was a try at that. Is is that? Well, so no. So these need. So what happens here is that what we're asking is we're keeping the mosquito population in place, but we want to get the gene in at a high frequency. Okay, you don't have to replace the existing mosquitoes, right? Basically, it's it's a it's called gene drive, but it turns out that there's the, that the the modelers have been keeping us busy because uh, early on we thought we needed things that would defeat Mendelian inheritance, and and that's probably a good thing to have. And there's a lot of work on that going on now. How you know if you have a mating with something that has a gene and doesn't have a gene, how do you make it so that only progeny that come out have a gene? That, that would give you a gene drive system, and people are working on that. But um, there's some recent modeling that just says, you know, if you dump a, a lot out there, it hmm. uh, might be good enough. You know, you don't necessarily need a drive. If, but there you would need, um, you would need um, uh, a minimum impact on fitness for the, for the gene to stay in the population. Yeah, as you said before, that anything you do to the mosquito is right. so that's compromise why- it. So we had assumed that anything we do would cause a fitness issue, yep. and that's why we, we were really interested in gene drive and stuff. Right. For the malaria parasites, uh, that, you know, if I may use a vernacular, well, not that, not that RNAi wasn't cool, you know, because it was very cool, but for the malaria parasites also was really cool. And this comes back to um, host specificity, mm-hmm. but in this case, now we're looking at the vertebrate side. And so there are a lot of different malaria parasites species out there. We have species that infect birds. We have species that infect mice. We have species that infect some reptiles, um, rodent. Well, I already said mice, but um, you know, non-human. Monkeys. Yeah, non-human primates. I'm sure. Yeah, non-human primates. And then we've got the ones that infect us. And uh, 
There are five now, Dixon. You knew that. They were coming, man. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been keeping up. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, and so if you take the human parasites and put them into a mouse, the mouse essentially laughs them off. Uh, it mounts a really strong immune response, yeah. uh, and, but it does, and it doesn't become infected with the human parasites. So colleagues of ours um, were using strategies like that, putting human parasites into mice, looking for the production of antibodies that would inhibit parasite development. And they were able to do that, and they were able to get a number of monoclonal antibodies. This is stuff that was done by uh, Antoniana Kretli. A number of people did. Um, stuff came out of the Nuisance Wag Lab a while back. I mean, it, it, there, were, there was a real interest in using monoclonals to define um, important uh, uh, antigen targets that might be useful in vaccines, and mice were used to do that. Well, somebody got the idea, and I thought it was great. This is work that um, came out of uh, Lou Miller's group, actually, at one point, uh, of mixing some of these antibodies with an infectious blood meal and feeding them to mosquitoes. That's right. And um, one of the remarkable observations were that these antibodies in the blood meal would actually inhibit parasite uh, development. Yes. And the cool thing about that is that the forms that they were inhibiting wouldn't even show up until later in the mosquitoes. So you could use a antibody to an, the infectious form of humans, the sporozoites, feed that with an infectious blood meal and mosquitoes, which was bringing in gametocytes, and that antibody would persist for two weeks and then disable the, the, wow. that, the that uh, form that came, you know, came about much later. And so the, the luck part of, of this is that for some reason when mosquitoes feed on blood, um, or any kind of meal, and there's IgG in that, that IgG not only gets across the, survives the mid-gut, but gets across it into the open circulatory system. So that's just a flat-out stroke of luck. <laughs> it doesn't get all completely chewed up in the gut. You can actually get really high titers of, of um, vertebrate uh, IgG and uh, mosquito hemolymph if you just feed them that. So we, we then said, okay, let's get a couple of these we did this first in the avian system and then moved it to the human system. Let's get um, some of these antibodies and see if we can clone them in a way that would be useful to make a gene out of. So these are IgGs. They both have a heavy chain and a light chain, but it's the variable portion that confers um, specificity. So um, there was technologies a while back where people were cloning out the variable portions of the heavy chains and light chains and fusing them in a single gene called single chain antibody. So we made single chain antibodies to the avian parasites and the human parasites and we were fortunate that expressing these actually re recapitulated the activity of the parental IgGs mm -hmm. which they were derived. And now we've got all these promoters. So we've got things that can express them in the mid-gut, we've got things that can express them nice. in the old. Cool. We can piece these together and make a gene that now targets these things in the right place in the right time. Cool. And there was a paper that came out last year, 2012, in PNAS, where a student of mine, Allison Isaacs, combined a couple of these and was able to get um, uh, a phenotype of uh, zero parasites in uh, salivary glands. Hmm. Nice. Neat. Yeah. I, I think that's cool. That's truly a chimera. You know, it's a yeah. Yeah, yeah. Of different species. Uh, you know, modification because these are the, the core parts of the molecules are derived from mice. We switched out um, codons so that you know they were more mosquito-like. But the the basic technology worked really well. And um, there's a lot of other kind of interesting aspects of the transgenesis that went in there. We used site-specific recombination, and we went into sites where we knew we had a minimal impact on fitness and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it was cool. This is a good time to ask you. Uh if you I don't know if you've seen uh, Maggie Korth Baker's uh, article in the New York Times on Sunday, and if so, what what are your thoughts? Her, her the gist of her article is basically when we mess with science, so when we release <laughs> modified mosquitoes, we're asking for trouble because we don't know what's going to happen, and nature is always going to respond in some way. What do you, what do you think about that? Uh, well, no, we all don't know what's going to happen, and yes, nature will respond. The question is, is that sufficient to prevent us from trying? Yes. <laughs> right. Right. And, and so, uh, I, you know, whatever I hear, that, and, and it, it, I think, I mean, I, I know what she was trying to do, and so I'm not, you know, I, it, uh, 
Um, I mean, she's right. We, we got to think about these things. And, and, and the concept of the whole stuff we did talked about and the aspects of rolling genetically engineered insects. You know, I, I spent weeks, you know, working on plans for plans. Okay. I mean, dealing with unknown unknowns. I mean, I. Yeah, yeah. And people have asked me, you know, you've got to have a plan for dealing with unknowns, okay? Uh, <laughs> unknown unknowns. No, but you won't tell them until you have to. <laughs> Down on it. But, you know, it was, it was uh, you know, you've got to think about how, how you know, how you're going to approach that. And, and I actually, it's, it's, I, think it's, I think it's good that we're forced to think about that. I really do. I mean, I've got a lot of colleagues, oh, I'm just going to make it lab and hand it off to somebody else. But that, who is that somebody else? I think yeah, it's that's exactly right. I mean, we're all stuck with Frankenstein's monster stories, and science never gets it right, and the, mm -hmm. the popular press, the film industry, the novels that come out, oh, they're all um, negative with regards to the way science is handled. And, uh, and science has actually made this world of ours what it is, and, and I think it's a wonderful place for the most part. So science, it's a science-driven world. Well, it should be. It is. It has to be. You know, and I'm, I'm tempted to take away all the science-based stuff from yeah. people who are anti-science. <laughs> you know, okay, you don't want it? Let me have your car, let me have your house, let me have your clothes, let me have your, you know. There's virtually nothing that, that they uh, do or, or um, behave for that is not uh, some product of scientific research. So, you know. Well, as Bob Dylan lyric, you know, you don't need the weatherman to know which way the wind. <laughs> yeah, that you know, I okay. With three three o'clock in the morning at Gordon conferences, you could always find Tony and myself sitting there, and I was listening to him playing Grateful Dead songs, but also Dylan songs too. So you're nice. You're still right on target there, big guy. <laughs> you do need a scientist to tell you whether you got. Warming, right? Well, that's right. That's right. And, and remember, we have a saying on this show, and we've said it both on TWIV and TWIP, uh, you should trust science, but do not trust scientists. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. we cling to our hypotheses, but uh, those hypotheses can be uh, changed and, yeah. and modified over time by just hard work and good observation. So, um, and, uh, yeah. and you're one of, one of the leaders in that field, by the way. I don't, you know, I, I, I'm the first to admit that, you know, that our techniques are supplemental, Com hopefully complementary, but supplemental. Here, here. Uh, to be used in places where other things don't work, uh, they're, used, they're to be used in sure. as an overall integrator, so I don't think that they alone work. But you were asking about, you know, this unknown stuff, and I'm just, you know, remembering that famous cartoon in that British publication when, you know, when Jenner was vaccinating people with cowpox, you know, and they were, right. the, I remember that image of cows growing out of the side, you know, I mean. <laughs> That's right, Gary Larson. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of uh, you know, some of it's at that level now. Some of it's a little bit more sophisticated, well, actually, quite a bit of it's more sophisticated, and those see. are the I'll things see. that we pay attention to. But the single biggest concern about, that, that's, the single biggest concern that people have are off-target effects. And that's where the genetic engineering, I think, is an exquisite solution because you, yeah. can, you know, can design these things in a way that minimizes, if not completely eliminates, the potential for off-target effects. Huh. You Absolutely. can use species-specific promoters. You know, I mean, and, uh, uh, you know, for the flightless stuff, if you know, if you want to get it out of the wild, you just, you know, it's got a, it's got a uh, zero fitness. You just stop letting it go. You know, yeah. and, and uh, it will die out. We remember the response that the uh, town of Cambridge had when uh, Harvard was first involved in genetic modification of E. coli. MIT. Uh, at MIT, sorry. And, and they actually passed laws that prevented <laughs> them from working on that for a while while they thought this thing yeah, over. So they went over to Harvard to do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's right. And okay. when, when did we stop mouth pipetting? <laughs> yeah, right. That's well, right. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I mean this. Uh, her, her article is is good as you say, Tony. But the the problem I have is that well, first of all, I think a lot of scientists do consider consequences, but we can't predict everything, so you can't no. can't always be ready for everything. No. And all she says is you have to think about the consequences. Well, sometimes you don't know what they're going to be. What is so. the consequence of a dengue outbreak? Well, we, are, so, we already know that. Yeah. Well, that was so. If I'm allowed to express a little disappointment, that uh, please that, do. <laughs> um, it would have been very interesting. I mean, this the article is very 
Western North centric. Yes. Uh, it, it, you know, um, yes. if you had uh, talked to somebody who um, lived in a disease endemic country who yeah, yeah, yeah. was really faced with the sort of risk benefit kinds of things that we all do all the time. Um, you know, for our current situation, um, um, most of us still drink water with fluoride in it. You know, I mean, there, you know, there's there's trade offs <laughs> that we've accepted uh, as part being part of public health, and and um, and you know, these don't have to be permanent solutions. They just have to be long enough to mitigate epidemics, and if we're lucky, to eradicate a pathogen. Sure. Yeah. Now it reminds me of vaccines where you do. Yeah. Clinical trials, and you it's safe, but then when you put it in 10 million people, then you find an effect that you hadn't seen before. So you, you get Guillain Barre or something, and, and, and it is, and, and it's, it's catastrophic for some people, and I understand that. Um, but and, and I, you know, it's, it's hard. So, this is the ethical sort of thing that comes out, you know. I mean, for that individual and their family, it's, 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 uh, you know, it, it's disastrous and life changing, of course. But I would argue that it, it's. Would be is equally disastrous and life changing for not just that family, but you know, thousands of families around them. If uh, they had you know an, a, a you know malaria epidemic or a dengue epidemic, of course. And I can it's, remember Bob Gwads addressing the General Assembly of the United Nations about the uh, peaceful use of DDT. Yeah, yeah. And he argued in favor. You know, if you have nothing else and DDT still works, why don't you want to use it? It's still the it's if if you have a malaria epidemic. Today and you and I was given one tool to, to to you know the fireman to go to put out the fire. Yep. Be um, indoor residual application. Of here, 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 here. I mean, that's it's that's today. That's our tool today. That's and, and too bad, take, but that's you know, it. You're takes right. a less than a gram probably to do a decent sized village. So you're not talking about putting a lot out there. Right. And um, it, it's it, you know it is the tool. Even Rachel Carson never said don't use it. She said don't misuse it. Well, no, and, and you know, the, the issues aren't with public health applications. They're from agriculture. Yeah, exactly. We weren't dumping tons of the stuff into the environment. Yeah, that, that's where it was really abused. Yeah. Tony, I want to thank you for joining us today. Great. And, um, how does, what's the format then? How does this work? <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be uploaded to a website. We'll send you the link. That'd be great. And everybody yeah. can listen. Okay. And maybe you'll come back sometime and talk about other issues that we didn't touch on today. Indeed. I'd be happy to. Yeah. That would be great. That's great reconnecting, Tony. All right, great. Uh, how you doing, Dixon? I'm doing good. I'm doing very, very good. You should check out the other shows that we've had. You, you'd enjoy listening to a lot of them because we feature entomological aspects uh, a lot. So, You were, you were you know, working on vertical farms. I am. That's correct. You're absolutely right. It's, it, they're building them now. Outstanding. Yeah. Outstanding. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, you take care. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Good luck. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye bye, Tony. Well, I'm sorry for that um, noise. Well, yeah, but that's the way it goes sometimes. I guess I didn't want to tell him to stop. I felt bad. No, no that's right. I should have, right? Well, I don't think so. No, I think this is fine. This is uh, noises off. You know, they have an, a, 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 an expression for this in show business. It's called noises it a, off. It was a musical by that name. It was a riot, by the way. I saw it three times. I it never was, saw it. That uh, was a funny, funny, funny play. It wasn't a musical, but it was just. Now, what all, does it mean, noises off? Noises off is a show business term for someone just dropped something backstage I during see. the soliloquy of Hamlet and spoiled right, the whole right. show. And, uh, you know, th so this show is based on that concept, and there, <laughs> there's noises yeah. off all over the place. Unfortunately, Tony uh, was. Well, he, he was using the mic on his laptop. Yeah. Which is part of the problem. So the premise of this show yeah. is that you've got the stage that faces the audience, and yeah. you get to see the rehearsal. And then yeah. they turn the stage backwards, and you got to see the same play again, only from the standpoint of what was going on backstage at the same time. Yeah, sure. So it was really a, it was a very funny play. Well, I hope that you can get beyond the noise to the content, because that was really good. I know you. the audience won't mind that at all, I don't think. Sometimes they mind. Well, they can write in they and can. tell They're, us. They expect good quality and i try to deliver it well you do but uh your buddy down there in uh the short guy what's his name peter hotez peter hotez he, uh, <laughs> the short guy he's about as tall as you are peter. <laughs> he's shorter than i am I, anyway i'm short and uh, so don't feel bad if i say short because i'm short oh uh, right exactly. he, he was very noisy also but nobody actually complained about that no one yeah that's true and, and i have a i have a breathe every now and then so you know what can i tell you
All right. Well, that was a good one. Thank you, Dixon, for organizing that. Uh, you're welcome. As Dixon. always, our shows will be at microbeworld.org slash twip and also on iTunes. And if you want to help us out, go over to iTunes and rate the show. Give it a couple of stars, five stars, if you think we deserve it. And that helps to keep us visible on the iTunes podcasting directory. As always, send us your questions and comments to twip at twiv.tv. I didn't read any today because I thought we should focus on Anthony James. Right. Dixon de Palmier is yes, at trichinella.org, medicalecology.com, and verticalfarm.com. Thank you for joining us today. You're welcome. Vincent. Thank you for making the show. <laughs> yeah, you're also welcome. You have a book coming out. I do. On parasites in March? Uh, no, it's coming out in June. Well, I got the galleys soon. Excellent. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. You can start writing on your next one. <laughs> I'm writing your next one. Anthony A. James is at the University of California, Irvine. Wow, what an interesting series of projects he has. Yes. And I am Vincent Rackhenyello. You can find me at virology.ws. The music used on TWIP is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkies. You can find his work at ronaldjenkies.com. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is parasitic. parasitic.